Hello and welcome to First Flight, a Star Trek Enterprise rewatch podcast where we are watching and discussing each episode of Enterprise in succession. First Flight is a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. This is Commander Tucker of Enterprise. We've got some information you're going to want to hear. Hi. I'm your co-host, Melanie. And I'm your co-host, Abby. And tonight, we are discussing the third episode of Season 1, Strange New World. This episode was written by Mike Sussman and Phyllis Strong, based on a story by Rick Berman and Brannon Braga. It was directed by David Livingston and aired on October 10th, 2001. But before we begin our discussion, we need to issue a read alert. Tactical alert. All hands to stations. There are potential spoilers ahead. On first flight, we might end up talking about any part of the series at any time. And now for a summary of the episode, it's time for Abby's Captain's Log. Okay, Abby, let's go. Captain Starlog Supplemental. While on their first away mission on an M-Class planet, the team gets stranded in a storm and begin to think that T'Pol is deceiving them and working with a species of rock people. All right, it's time to deploy our subspace transmitters and get into this episode. Abby, what did you think about Strange New World? All right, well, first thing I want to say is there is so much eating in Enterprise, and I always knew this, but... I mean, this is our third episode, and this is the third time we've seen a meal scene, which I just think is kind of interesting. And it's a nice way to check in with our crew and all the different pairings that you might not get in other ways. So I, I think that's fun. And I know people have made fun of Enterprise for that, especially the first couple of seasons with being so food heavy. But I think it's it's absolutely hilarious. And I love like when... Flax and T'Pol sit down and they're talking about all the sensory stuff and everything. I always think it's a fun thing to see them eat. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it makes them just seem like real people doing real things in a regular old day. And I really like in the mess hall when Cutler and Novakovich and the other Lower Decks people are looking out the window and, you know, seeing what's going on and saying, you know, I was wondering, would the captain make an announcement or something? The thing I really like about that scene is it shows how not everybody on the ship is in the loop like the senior staff is of what's going on. There's people just doing their jobs who are waiting to be filled in. So I really liked that. Yeah, I like that too. And I like that we see Cutler here for the first time because I think she's an interesting character and she's very different than our senior staff because she isn't in the loop. And that is a nice thing to see because you know that the majority of the people on the ship are not in the loop. They're just making the ship run. And it takes a lot of time and effort to make the ship run. And I like that we see that in Enterprise, that we see them, you know, with the nuts and the bolts and the how things are actually getting done. And I think that's, that's a super fun thing to see. And I like poor Novakovich, who is a bit (laughs) of our red shirt in this one. I mean, he has a rough transporter moment in this episode. (laughs) Oh, poor guy. (laughs) You know, but at least, at least we didn't have a red shirt moment with him and Cutler. She kind of, you know, pops back here and there. Yeah, I, I like Cutler a lot, too. I think she's a great character. The actress does a great job. I'm glad we get to see her again. I totally agree. And the thing with Novakovich, I did read that originally he does die in the episode. And for some reason, they changed it to he's going to be okay. I can't remember why but the original plan was for him to die well i am glad he made it even if he had you know he became one with the trees literally abby this has always been one of my favorite episodes of season one i think it's really interesting and engaging and intriguing and i'm actually remembering the very first time i saw it and when travis sees those figures go into the woods Mm -hmm. And then, you know, later the rock people. And at that point, I thought it was real. I remember being pretty freaked out. That was, that was pretty scary. And well done. (laughs) 
No, I agree. And they set that scene so nicely with the campfire and the ghost stories and all that. And I remember the first time I watched it, I was watching it alone at night and <laughs> I, I got a little creeped out too. But on this yep. watch, speaking of you saying that, you know, Travis saw people going into the woods. I'm wondering, because Travis was the one who started with the, I saw something, I saw someone. And I wonder, because, you know, you always hear about people who have, you know, mass hallucinatory experiences, they play off each other. So I wonder mm -hmm. if somebody else had seen something and communicated it with them first, would this have been a whole different episode? Now, obviously, it wouldn't have made good TV if they all just dreamed about rabbits and marshmallows or whatever. <laughs> I just wonder if that was what set everybody else off about these rock people was Travis planting that that seed, both with his ghost story and with seeing someone for the first time. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's a distinct possibility. Regarding the campfire scene, something I wanted to mention, I love that scene, by the way. Me too. Um, I love campfires in general. I mean, this is one of my favorite scenes of the episode, and there are a couple things I really like about it. I like Trip in this scene a lot, and I think it establishes right off the bat that Trip is a commander. He's a leader. He's a supervisor. He's, you know, up there on the chain of command. But at the same time, he has he's so down to earth and casual and friendly and has such good camaraderie with the crew that I like that he can, you know, maintain that commanderhood while also being real with people and I like their camaraderie in this scene when he says you know Ooh. yeah <laughs> and I also think it's great how to pause there off at the side doing her work chiming in you know in all her seriousness while they're doing the ghost stories I think it's a good scene I agree and I think this episode really does a lot for both Trip and to Paul in character growth. And that's mm -hmm. the obvious ones, but we get a lot of growth from the other people too. Like we learn a lot about Travis in this episode. We learn, you know, even seeing that trio of Trip and Archer and Mayweather going off and how they're talking and they're bantering back and forth. You see that Trip and Archer are already friends, but you see Travis kind of coming in on that. And I think having a commander who's his friend helps Trip do the same thing to those under his command. And that's such a positive of Jonathan Archer that once he, he trusts you, you are there and he's, he's good and he's going to good naturedly rib you, but he's going to be there for you thick and thin and, and have some fun with all this because this is the, their first exploration. This is the first away mission. They better have some fun. Yep. And I love how Porthos bolts out <laughs> right out of the shuttle pod there for the first away mission. <laughs> Where no dog has gone before. Exactly. And Porthos moments are always just smile worthy. Definitely. I also want to talk a little bit about when they're roaming around and they're on their little exploratory missions. How it's it's a funny montage. Like I, I'm all for a montage, but this one, it you know, we've we're scanning bugs we're looking at the water we're you know enjoying nature Novakovic gets a big old snoot full of pollen when he huffs that flower so there's some foreshadowing you notice that the next time around but the whole thing and the music and everything kind of made it feel like one of those old school commercials to come visit some beautiful area in a you know a state that's close to yours or something and they're trying to get your tourism but they don't have a ton of budget so they're like just go walk out where it's pretty and we'll put some music behind it but <laughs> maybe that's just me I, I live in the midwest we get a lot of those around here it's, i can totally see what you're saying and I, I have a few thoughts about that when they're out there exploring and the sky is so blue and the grass is so green and those flowers are so yellow. It reminded me of what you said in our Broken Bow podcast about the different color tones of the different mm -hmm. scenes, about how, you know, the Enterprise is very stark and gray. And it's kind of neat to, like, I really felt the sunshine on this planet. And, you know, at the end when like Cutler looks out of the cave and everything, I think the cinematography or whatever it's officially called is just so good. It really does feel outside and almost commercial. Like I totally see what you what you're saying. And I agree that the color palette has a lot to do with the feeling of this episode, too. I mean, when you're having Archer and Malcolm talking about a rescue mission or if they have to pull them out. 
they're up on the ship. It's sterile. They're staying calm. They're trying to figure this out. Archer's even getting exasperated about some stuff. And then uh, you come down to the planet where that's got the beautiful sun in the sky until the storm. And then the lighting there, everything kind of gets those blue gray tones. They go into the cave. You start getting the shadows and the creepiness. That is just some excellent directing choices, some excellent lighting choices, some excellent scenery choices. I mean, you know, those caves are redressed a thousand times to be every cave in every Star Trek episode ever. So it's Mm -hmm. nice when they really look more unique. And I think the contrast between the beautiful day outside and then the storm in the cave and the consistency of the enterprise really kind of makes a nice balance. I I completely agree. And I have to give them a lot of credit for that. And the visual effects, I know we've talked about some of the visual effects hold up really well from Enterprise, some maybe not so much, but that's that's fair. It's been 20 years, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, but, I, but I have to say that the rock people visual effects, I thought was pretty darn good. Yeah, part of what made this so interesting was that the rock people were straddling that fine line of the is it real or is it not real? And part of that was because you couldn't tell if they looked like that because they were computer generated or did they look like that because they were imaginary or some of both. And if they ever go back and redo effects in Enterprise, which who knows if they ever will, they better not touch this episode or at least not that effect. I agree. I would I would not want them to mess with that. I like it just the way it is. You know, you mentioned the ribbing from Archer. He definitely does some ribbing of T'Pol here when he says, you know, let's send that photo to the high command. Right. I think, you know, they're still trying to establish like they did in the ready room in Broken Bow when, you know, Trip to Paul and Archer are kind of all being snarky together. Yep. They're continuing some of that. You know, he's joking around and I'm glad that they resolve that fairly quickly throughout this season. And I think Archer is really trying to find his footing. He can't use the same skills and the same strategies to to get to Paul's trust and to get to know her and to develop that relationship that he would with Trip or Mayweather or Hoshi or even Flax because she's very different. And I think he's putting a bunch of things out there and trying to see what's going to work. And that one totally didn't. But we've all been there. Tried something and went, right, just stuck my foot in my mouth, going to move on. <laughs> Totally. You know what? That's a really good point. I think they, you know, they want to show that he still is sort of, quote unquote, awkward around Vulcans per se. And I love how their relationship develops. Just, I just thought it was interesting that they, you know, threw that in there to kind of keep that continuity going. But Agreed. you're right. It's awkward. You're trying to bond with people and Cutler tries to bond with her as well. Exactly. You know, with the Plomeek soup and people are trying to get to know each other. It's only the third episode they're all kind of feeling each other out and that's another thing I like about this episode is it you know puts them in a situation where they sure do get to know each other exactly you know in Archer's favor I really love in this episode how quick thinking he is I mean we see this in a lot of episodes with Archer but right here we see how Archer's trying to get through the trip this is of course later during the intense part at the end Archer's trying to get through the trip. It's not working. Everything he's trying is not working. So really quickly, he has to get creative under pressure, under serious pressure, and Mm -hmm. figure out this plan with Hoshi, with the play acting. And I give Archer so much credit for thinking on his feet so often in this series. I completely agree. And I really enjoy seeing how he, he does reach out and try to make that connection with Trip, with the friendship and the history and all that. And he does everything he can before he gets to the point where he's going to be like, all right, DePaul, just shoot the guy. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's exactly what he should be doing as a commander. And one of the things that I like here, and we're talking about that intense scene for a minute, that as Trip gets more and more affected by the pollen, he seems younger and younger. And I think that's a deliberate choice from the actor. He's, he's going back to, you know, what we would think of as teenager or early twenties, like gut reactions about how we were all much more impulsive and emotional and less logical. And he seems younger, but I also have to remind myself that even in the show, he's not that old, you know, he's what in his thirties. 
the yeah. character is in his 30s. And that's while that is a lot of life experience, it is it's not everything. You've got a lot of growing left to do. And so I think that was a deliberate choice. And I think it was interesting to see. And you see him in the four seasons really take some of those big emotional growing steps to not just be a professional, but to be a person in there too. And I think this is this is where that starts. And the chemistry between Tripp and Paul definitely starts here too. For sure. You've brought up so many good points. I mean, the acting in this scene is just so spectacular. They're both at the top of their game, I think. And you're right. He does seem younger. I never thought about that before. But, you know, I'm going to split you in two. He gets extremely agitated. He also harbors Vulcan feelings as well. Correct. And so, you know, I think when he and T'Pol are going through this thing at the end, that's definitely coming out at that point, obviously. But he also owns his stuff. He's accountable. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's another thing I love about Tripp is when he messes up or does something he's not proud of, he says, I shot my mouth off or, you know, he he owns his stuff. And when he says to her at the end that his teacher said to him, challenge your preconceptions. Yes. I love that callback to Broken Bow when Archer says, I need to, you know, challenge my assumptions or whatever his exact quote is in Broken Bow. It's a callback to that where they are thinking about, I need to rethink how I think about things. There's a way big world out here now and we need to adjust our perspectives. And I I love that about Trip. I agree. And I think that was on my list to talk about too, the challenge your preconceptions or they will challenge you. And what an active lesson in that he got this week. And I agree completely. The fact that he owns up to things, he always apologizes. He's always trying to do his best. He's thinking back and reflecting on what he did and what he could have done better and all that. That's what makes a good person. You're never going to find somebody who's perfect all the time. And if you did, they'd be boring. So it's good to see him really stepping up and doing all that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Trip fan. I think when push comes to shove, he probably is my favorite character in the series. I just I love, like you said, the character development in this episode is so good. And the and it just keeps us on our toes. It's a it's a great mystery. It's a great spooky. I mean, I love spooky stuff. So this one definitely stands out for me. Well, I have to put in there real quick that um I do have to say that there are two classic sci-fi tropes in this one with the fast moving storm and space pollen. So yeah, if you've watched it of Star Trek, you have seen versions of one or both of these uh, two, three dozen times. If you've watched greater sci-fi, you're up in the hundreds. So that always kind of makes me just roll my eyes a little bit going, it's the third episode and you had to put two tropes in. Come on guys. But they did do it well. They did it well. They did it well, just like Spock and the Spores did it well. There you go. Well, I'd like to shout out to older stuff as well. For example, we find out what an M-class planet is called, Minshara class. Yep. And I love that. And plus, we get to see T'Pol do a nerve pinch. Yes, I agree. That's super fun as well. I like that Class M is something that had been explained in like books and technical manuals and things beforehand, but now it is set on screen. So now it is officially camp. So that's always fun. If I could talk about flocks for a moment. Yes. I love flocks. I do too. (laughs) This is such a good episode highlighting his stuff when he realizes that he made an error in judgment and he feels so badly about it. That moment always gets to me. I'm glad that they were able to save Novakovich, but boy, it's touch and go there. And poor Phlox is feeling very guilty. And that scene with him and Archer together, the acting again is top notch because they don't say much, but you can read it on their faces, you know? And their body language. Definitely. That last, last little clip of Phlox and you just see him and he's standing there and his shoulders just sag. Like you feel the weight of that. Yeah. And if I could just throw one little jokey, you know that whenever I do a little critique, it's with love. Oh, of course. I've got one more, too. When Flox puts the ointment on Novakovich, he has no gloves on. Oh, my God. 
Maybe they can decontaminate their hands beforehand with a light or something. There's but. probably <laughs> some futuristic reason. And believe me, I'm not losing sleep over it. It just, when I rewatched it, it kind of stood out to me this time. <laughs> Well, if it makes you feel any better, what stood out to me this time as goofy is my family camps a lot and they're in those tents and I'm like, they're in the tents because of a storm, but it does not seem that their windows can zip up or (laughs) if they can, none of them did that. So good thing it was just a windstorm, not a rainstorm, because those tents would not have kept them dry. That is a good point. Every time. I've, I've been in many a storm in a tent and I can tell you that you want to zip those windows up because it stops with all that rocket they were having so many issues with. You're right. See, you know the laws of physics. <laughs> I just thought of something else about this amazing acting that we're seeing in this episode. Mm-hmm. When T'Pol kind of slips over, you can tell she's holding on for dear life till she kind of loses it a little bit. I mean, she always holds on. She never completely loses it. But when she does make that shift, when she says, all I see is a delusional engineer, yep, it totally reminds me of the episode Impulse that we'll get to later. But yep. you can see the seeds planted there. And I love that. It's in the eyes and the jaw. Like, yeah. 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 I agree completely. And I always wondered, did anybody translate the Vulcan that she and Hoshi start speaking to each other? Does it actually say, hey, you're going to pretend like, you know, this, this and that, and then you're going to shoot him on stun? Or is it, you know, somebody's recipe for tomato soup cake? They're usually pretty good about making it real. Right, right. That is a good question. I wonder who they have behind the scenes doing Vulcan efficiency tests. (laughs) Proficiency tests. Not my strong suit, but I always wonder. Another thought that I had about T'Pol in this episode is I like the way they have this quasi misdirect where things are really creepy. You don't know what's what. We haven't been let in on everything yet. And T'Pol is delivering all her lines in this monotone kind of eerie way, which I mean, she's a Vulcan, so she speaks you know, fairly monotone most of the time. But in this particular episode with the way she's speaking and the way the lighting is on her when she says, you know, would you care to join me in the back of the cave and all of that, it's definitely like a little creepy misdirect. And I I liked that. I do too. And I, I enjoy how you see in this episode that people are trying to make a relationship with T'Pol. I mean, she started out, she could have screwed over Archer when he was unconscious back in Broken Bow, and she didn't. So they trust her a bit, but not all the way. And there's still a lot of that. We don't trust the Vulcans. They held us back. They're doing things that we don't know about. But Archer, you know, tries to get her in the photo. Cutler tried Plomic Broth and is talking about it. So they're, they're trying those inroads, but she's not super receptive. So that also amps this up that, you know, they've really tried to pull her into the circle or get her in the ghost story and she's busy tapping at the pads. So there were a lot of layers there that are very to Paul, but since we don't know her as well as we get to in the future, they can seem a little off-putting and they could be a little bit creepy or definitely darker than what we know are to Paul to be. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And now that you've mentioned that, it got me thinking that, you know, I think so much about how we feel about T'Pol. How is the crew viewing T'Pol? And I don't think as much about how is T'Pol viewing them? And I like that in this episode, she says at the end, I've learned a great deal about, you know, I'm learning a great deal about human behavior when she's <laughs> affected by the pollen, right? Yes. And she's kind of speaking her mind more. And sometimes I forget that DePaul is sort of alone on her own with this journey as being, you know, one of the only other non-humans. And I love that's why she bonds with Phlox so much in those scenes that I love with her and Phlox. But sometimes I forget that she's observing human behavior as well and and absorbing that and maybe thinking about that as well. Yeah, and I always think about how, you know, she can smell more and taste more and all those things and if you're on a planet and that wind kicks up, you better believe that that she's definitely smelling and tasting some things that other people aren't and I don't know about you, but I I don't want to be around a bunch of sweaty scared humans if I already think they stink <laughs> after a shower. So 
just saying, there's a lot going on there that she's dealing with when she gets compromised herself. You know, sometimes I forget about that, Abby, and I think back to the beginning of Broken Bow. You know, have it coming up again in in the Andorian incident and other episodes. It'll, well, I think that was the one where we'll mm-hmm. hear that again. But they don't mention it that often, so sometimes I forget about that. The other thing I was thinking about with this scene in the cavern at the end, which I think this is one of the reasons I like this episode so much, is I think structurally it builds to this really interesting final act. And I like the build up to it. And I think the part where DePaul goes to the back of the cave and Cutler perceives her speaking with these aliens, you know, from Cutler observing to Paul to, you know, Travis start not to me, Travis not feeling well, and then Trip coming back and Cutler saying, no, she's lying, sir. That's another thing I really like about Cutler is She's a crewman and she has no hesitations in standing up and speaking her mind and saying, "Uh, no, sir, she's lying. I saw her talking to them very matter of factly. Now, that could be the pollen, but I also think Cutler's just a strong character. And I I just like the way those scenes build to this final act. I agree. And I think that that T'Pol actually does respect her more after that because she did that like when you see that Mm -hmm. they're all recovered and everybody's better and any the future interactions they have she knows that this is a woman who's going to stand up for what she believes is right and do what she thinks is right even if it's not easy and even if it's not necessarily in agreement with her superior officer and that's that's a valuable thing to know about somebody and what a cool thing for them to give to our first non-main cast woman reoccurring character Mm-hmm, for sure. I think the things I love so much about this episode is it's just, for me, it's just a great story. Like I, I, like I said, it's a great, creepy, neat story. Lots of character development, great acting. Overall, I'm loving it. Do you have any other thoughts? No, I think I'm going to save my last thought for my Porthos pick. All right. <laughs> And now we've arrived at Porthos's pick, which is our favorite part of the episode. Abby, what's your favorite part of Strange New World? All right. So we did just touch on it a little bit, but I'm going to expand a bit. That Flox and Archer and Sick Bay apology scene. Mm. This time when I, I watched the episodes a couple of times before we do this. And this time, every time I watched it, I got teary. And... I just, I think that that scene is playing and ringing differently now that, I mean, when we record this, this is April of 2021, and the world has just been through a medical tragedy, and there's been a lot of trying our best and having it fail, and that resonated so much with me now, and this was decades ago that they filmed it, but watching healers work as hard as they can and do everything they can and then feel guilty for not having foreseen the unexpected seems like it's been the story of life for the past year. So watching this and watching Archer understand and yet still feel those same feelings really, really just got me good this time around. So I wanted to expand on that a little more. Yeah. I, now that you mentioned that, I, I agree. It, it already is a, heavy dramatic scene and you know based on what you're saying putting it with today's times yeah that's that's extremely poignant and you know archer and Flox have a special relationship i think and and they have a lot of good scenes together and this scene even though it's different content this also kind of reminds me of the scene in damage which Mm -hmm. is you know later down the line also but you know archer and Flox get real with each other it still plants the seeds for their relationship, which I have always found really poignant, including, sorry, another one just popped into my brain. The doing tons of spoilers here on first flight. (laughs) All I'll just say is baby Elizabeth. That's all I'll say. Yes. Yeah. That that's a great pick for favorite part. Well, and we haven't had an episode yet that really does a deep dive into Flux. We've been picking up little things here and there. And we know so much more having watched the series multiple times, but this being just the third time, maybe fourth, if people watch the premiere as two episodes, that people are seeing him, they know he's been out there. He's been to more worlds. He knows more aliens. He's got a menagerie. He's competent. 
and he still didn't figure this one out and he still feels bad that that's a different level too and it's it makes him humanizing is the wrong word but it really deepens him because you see him not just as the goofy smiling guy but he's being a serious doctor now and when push comes to shove he's got the smarts and he's his heart is breaking when he feels like he can't do enough and that's that's a lot of what Flox is consistently. More great character development in this third episode, which is why we love Enterprise and we think it's so great. Yep. My pick is a moment. You know, sometimes I choose scenes and longer things, but for this one, it is a quick moment. I love the part where Novakovich says, go to hell to Archer and Malcolm. And he says, go to hell. Because Archer and Malcolm don't really know what's going on. They know there's problems, but they don't really, they're not there. And when, you know, Crewman Novakovich says, go to hell to his superior officer, Malcolm and Archer both know that something really off is going on here and something serious is going on. And Archer and Malcolm give each other that look like, what the heck? I just love that dramatic moment. So that's one of my favorites. Yep. I agree. I think, and it, it is that look that's just between them where they're like, hmm, all right, well, this has taken on a whole deeper meaning. And I like that and there's a bunch of those little Malcolm and um, Archer moments in there where, you know, when they're trying to get ready and they're trying to land the shuttle and it doesn't work and they're, you know, making standby plans, they're both just showing how deeply caring and competent they are. And they are already starting to, to communicate beyond just verbally. And that's cool to see that start too. You know, when they, when they're going to pick up the group and they can't land and Tripp says, I think you forgot someone captain and Archer says, you guys are just going to have to hang on, but all he, he has to be professional and just say, okay, we'll do our best. But you know, that deep down he's like, Oh no. Oh no. Yep. <laughs> on the first flight podcast, we like to share a bit of trivia about the episode. Abby, what can you tell us about strange new world? So the planet, this first M-Class 1 visited by the NX-01, we find out later in In a Mirror Darkly Part 2 by looking at a bio screen that was later named Archer 4. And the planet Archer 4 was originally mentioned as the site of a battle between the Klingons and the Enterprise D in yesterday's Enterprise. So lots of connections with this planet. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's cool. The people who write these really know their Star Trek. You know, I love when things are named after Archer. Me too. I like that. My trivia this time is not a happy piece of trivia, unfortunately, but I do think it needs to be said that the actress Kelly Waymeyer, who plays Cutler and did such a good job, died just two short years after this episode at age 36 of a cardiac arrhythmia. And I just find that so sad. Um, So when I watch the episode now or any episodes with her, I can't not think about that because that is way too young. And she was such a good actress. She had a lot of acting credits to her name and certainly would have done a lot more stuff. So I just wanted to mention that. I agree. And I know that the plan originally was to have Cutler reoccurring throughout all four seasons and then you'd notice that she just disappears and they don't mention it in the show, but we know the real life reason for it. And I agree. It makes all of these scenes that much more poignant and bittersweet, but what a talent. Definitely. Transfer of data is complete. And now it's time for our Vulcan's verdict on a scale of one to 10 grapplers. How do you rate this episode? Abby. So I had a hard time with this one because I really do like all of the crew development and the backstory and all that, but the double sci-fi trope took it from an eight to a seven for me. So it's super solid and I really like it. I just wish they had stuck with one instead of two of them. Okay. What about you, Melanie? Yeah, as I mentioned, this is one of my favorites of season one. It's always had a little special place for me. So I'm giving it eight out of 10 grapplers. And if our listeners would like to continue the discussion, how do they reach you, Abby? The best place to find me is on Twitter at Abby M. Summer. That's S-O-M-M-E-R. 
I'd love to see if their ratings match ours. Yeah. Send us your ratings. You can reach me on Twitter at ShuttlePod2, ShuttlePod T-W-O. And our podcast can be reached at First Flight Pod. We want to thank you for spending this time with us. And we hope you'll join us next time when we will discuss Season 1, Episode 4, Unexpected. And as always, we leave you with this quote from Captain Jonathan Archer. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us. Woven into the threads that bind us, all of us, to each other.